let's continue with our next one um, by the name of Merritt E. Cornell. I do not know what his middle initial stands for in our work this last time to put together the items uh, um, on the CD-ROM. We I was not able to determine what his middle initial E stood for. Um, the issue that we have on him is volume six, number one, actually, of Lest We Forget, um, entitled The Law and the Testimony on the cover page, but the article dealing with uh, Cornell is Merritt E. Cornell in the Spirit of Peter. may give you a little bit of a hint of where we're going with this man, uh, what his personality perhaps was like, and maybe his weaknesses and his strong points. So let's consider briefly about this gentleman, Merritt E. Cornell. Um, this last gentleman here in our uh, outline of the pictures on the board. He was born January 29, 1827 in Chile, New York. A very interesting name of a town, C-H-I-L-I. -I. Um, it's also near Rochester. That's why I'm saying a lot of these people from that western part of New York there. In 1837, at the age of 10, apparently with his parents, obviously, he moved to Michigan. And at the time of the passing of the time, in 1844, at the age of 17, he was a believer in the Advent uh, at the time of the disappointment. Some uh, five years later, June 23rd of 1849, he's married at the age of 22 to Angeline Lyon, the daughter of Henry Lyon. They dedicate their lives to preaching the Advent message. So they are still Advent believers after passing time and even with his wife. 1852, um, age of 25, Joseph Bates, in his endeavor to carry the news of the Sabbath all over. He's in Michigan. Okay? This is before the review. Re review, remember, moves to Michigan in 1855. Three years before. Bates is in Michigan. He actually, as I was reading through it, he put an announcement in the review. On such and such a date, I'm going to be on in, I think it was Jackson, New York. Yeah, Jackson, Jackson Michigan, I'm, I'm sorry. Jackson, Michigan, I'm going to be there holding meetings. And so we know uh, Bates' plans. He's, a, he's having a conference at, a, at the home of the Palmers in Jackson, and it seems almost like it was coincidental that, uh, you know, by chance, along comes Merrick Cornell and his wife coming by the home of the Palmers, and somebody says, hey, there's a, there's a preacher in there trying to show that we should keep the seventh day of the Sabbath. And because he was already involved with preaching, I'll just go in there and show this guy where he's wrong. <laughs> he steps inside, and he was amazed by the presentation. He accepts the message about the Sabbath, third angel's message. He begins preaching it. In fact, the story is that on his way home that very day, <laughs> he has to stop and tell his friend J.P. Kellogg, who he sees out in the field, about the Sabbath truth. And that gets Brother Kellogg to study about it. And then they go and tell Angeline's father, Henry Lyon. And immediately he joins Hiram Case on a preaching tour in Michigan and Indiana. So you can see Peter here. Grabs it and he runs with it. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with this message. And interestingly enough, Kellogg, Lyon, and two other believers by the name of Cyrenius Smith and Dan Palmer were later instrumental in bringing the review to Battle Creek, publishing work from Rochester because they financed the land and the building for the first publishing house. So again, is it significant that this man has been used by God? He hears the message and he immediately shares it, and the people he shares it with, two of them, become leaders that help to bring the publishing work to Battle Creek and finance it. So again, God's using him in a, in a significant way. Um, 1853, the next year, he's 26 years old in May, he meets James and Ellen White on their first trip to Michigan. And again, James and Ellen White had spent their early years where? New England. New England. You know? And then they're moved into New York. But now they're their first trip west. <laughs> By that time, Michigan was in the west. And uh, he meets them on their first trip. And he joins J.M. Loughborough on an evangelistic tour through Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. These people traveled, carrying the message, preaching. And where do they usually hold their meetings? Do you, do you recall reading or hearing? Homes, schoolhouses. 
homes and schoolhouses. The biggest, obviously, homes had to be large. School schoolhouses were bigger than homes often, and maybe other halls and things like that. But watch what's going to happen. Next year, 1854, he's 27 years old, also in May. Why, why would you think May? Why are we thinking May, May here all the time? Because May is springtime. And it's the beginning, it's the beginning of the time where you can get around. The mud is not quite as bad <laughs> as it was when things first started to thaw out and all the snow started melting. They didn't have paved roads back then. You got to sort of picture here. So this is the time of the year where they start being more active. He helps elders White and Loughborough with evangelism in a place called Locke, Michigan, but only half of the people fit it, fit in the schoolroom used for the meetings. Okay, and after the meetings, Brother White says they should purchase a tent next year. But what does Cornell do? He says, let's do it right away. <laughs> this is Peter, right? Why are we going to wait till next year? Let's buy it right now. And so when they go to their next meeting place, they actually raise the money for it. And they send him on a trip to purchase, the, 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 which we'll read about here shortly. And with that tent, he and Loughborough conducted June the 2nd to June the 4th in Battle Creek, Michigan, the first Sabbatarian Adventist tent meeting ever conducted. Now remember, under the, under the Millerite movement, they had all types of camp meetings with tents, right? But the Sabbath-keeping Adventist, ever since they've been keeping the Sabbath, which was clear back in 40, 46, right? 45 and 46, they began with the Sabbath. This is almost 10 years. They've been traveling around spreading the message, but they didn't have a tent of their own, using these other buildings, as we've said. So, for the first time, First Sabbath of Adventist tent meeting. And we still do this, right? We still are using tents at times. Um, the next week they took the tent to Grand Rapids and how many people were in attendance? A thousand people. And his wife, Angeline, helped to follow up Bible interest in the meetings. So she worked as a assistant with the evangelism and did sort of follow up Bible studies with the interests that were there. So she was a very much of a helper in the evangelism as well. I thought I would throw in Jan Loughborough's description of this year. How would you like to read that? On May 18 and 19, we held meetings in a schoolhouse in Locke, Michigan. Such a crowd came that two house, schoolhouses that size would not have held them. So he says not even half got in there. In the emergency, we took out a window and improvised a pulpit on the empty space so we could speak to all the people inside and out, seated in their carriages and on the grass. So you get the picture. They're in the schoolhouse sitting on the, on the seats. They're outside on their carriages and sitting on the grass and they've got a window. <laughs> They take a window out of the schoolhouse, and the preacher's there in the window preaching for both groups. The sight of this large assembly led to conversation the next day as to the feasibility of holding tent meetings. As we traveled to Sylvan, Elder White suggested that by another year we might venture the use of a tent. Why not have one at once, Elder Cornell urged. The more we talked, the more we were impressed to do so. On arriving at C.S. Glover's about noon on the 22nd, Elder White explained to him that we thought of what we thought of doing. He asked what the tent would cost. When he was told that $200 would deliver it to Jackson, he handed Elder uh, White $35, saying, this is what I think of it. <laughs> In other words, start, start collecting money. Mm -hmm. By late afternoon, we reached Jackson and saw Brother Smith, Palmer, and J.P. Kellogg. Each of these expressed his opinion in the same manner <laughs> as had Brother Glover, mm -hmm. with the exception of Brother Kellogg, who promised to lend us all that was lacking to purchase it. So... Within, within uh, what, the same day, they'd raise all the money. Near the sunset of that day, Elders White, Cornell, and I retired to a grove and laid the matter before the Lord in earnest prayer. At noon of the May 23, Elder Cornell started for Rochester to purchase of E.C. Williams the first meeting tent ever used by a Seventh-day Adventist. Of course, um, be aware that Loughborough is using the term Seventh-day Adventist here, not because that's what they were called then, but because that's what they were later known as. Um, they, we hadn't picked that name yet in, in 1854. At Rochester, Elder Cornell went directly to the sail loft of E.C. Williams. What does he mean by sail loft? Well, where the warehouse? Where they were stored. The, the, the canvas tents, the canvas material they used for tents, they also used for sailing ships, right. that, which was the way the ships got around back then. By and large, it was, there were sailing ships still in the 1850s. They went to the sail loft of E.C. Williams, apparently a company, 
Pleased to learn that we were going to use tents in our meat labors, this earnest first day Adventist <laughs> said, I have a 10 ounce circular tent 60 feet in diameter that was used only 10 days on a state fairground. It is as good as new. Since I got a good price for the use of it, I will sell it to you for the cost of the material, $160. In addition, I will give you a nice bunting flag, 15 feet in length, with, with the motto on it, What is Truth? <laughs> the bargain was speedily completed, and in a few hours, the tent was on its way to Jackson. Amazing stories, huh? In two weeks from the time we first spoke of the tent enterprise, our tent was erected in Battle Creek on the southeast corner of Tompkins and Van Buren Streets. It was my privilege to give the first sermon. <laughs> Loughborough. Our voices sounded well from that elevated location. They said they could hear me preach a mile away. No. Elder Cornell spoke alternately with me in that meeting. So again, what do you have a picture of here? You have Brother Cornell and Brother Loughborough co-preaching in the evangelistic series. And whose idea was it to get going on this? Cornell. Cornell's. Why wait a year? Let's do it now. He's a man of, of quick action, right? Mr. Noble, the postmaster of Battle Creek, lived not far from the tent and became very interested. He told everyone he saw to go up to the tent and they would hear something worthwhile. So we had crowds in those three days of our first tent meeting by 7th the Adventist. Returning from Wisconsin about the middle of June, the Whites met with us in Grand Rapids for a three-day general meeting of our people in that part of the state. It also gave the crowds of citizens at our meeting an opportunity to learn our beliefs. So again, beginning of our tent evangelism. It took a big jump forward with, with, with buying tents. And then if you read carefully in the review, you know what you'll notice? They'll talk about the New York tent or the Michigan tent. Because each conference then bought its tent, apparently, at one point, uh, at least if they could afford it, and they began to move it around their conference, holding meetings. That was what, the, what they did in those days. Um, 1855, just the next year, he's now 28 years old. Brother Cornell contributes to a report. And this was actually a report of a committee, a committee composed of him, Bates, and Wagner, J.H. Wagner, the one that we just covered, on spiritual gifts. Uh, given to the 1855 conference in Battle Creek that proved to be a milestone in the acceptance of Ellen White's prophetic gift. Um, 1855, right? That's a significant date. Uh, that's the date that they started publishing the Review and Herald there in Battle Creek. Remember that. 1858, three years later, he's 31. He authors a 137 book on doctrines entitled Facts for the Times. In 1862, age of 35, he authors a book entitled Miraculous Powers, The Scriptural Testimony on the Perpetuity of Spiritual Gifts, illustrated by narratives of incidents and sentiments carefully compiled from the eminently pious and learned of various denominations. How do you like that for a book title? <laughs> uh, basically, it's on how God still works miraculously through the gifts of the Spirit. Okay? So he's not only writing a book on the spiritual gifts related to Ellen White, but she's writing, he's writing one on just the uh, work of the Holy Spirit in general. 1871, this is nine years later, he's 44 years old, he helps Loughborough pioneer the Third Angel's message in California. Again, this is three years after Loughborough began the work. But he joins them in California, and there are records of evangelistic meetings, successful evangelistic meetings, San Francisco, Woodland, uh, anybody happen to know where Woodland is? If you look at a map, it's where Sacramento Na uh, Municipal Airport is, Sacramento International Airport is, um, right where Interstate 5 goes west of Sacramento and just before it turns north and heads up the Sacramento Valley. That's called Woodland. Um, Woodland, uh, also St. Helena, Oakland, San Jose, and Santa Clara. So all around there in the Bay Area, which is uh, where the early work was focused in California. Next year, he's 45 years of age, January 20, uh, 28th, he receives a letter from Ellen White. Does the messenger enjoy writing these letters? She said, I would do anything if I didn't have to write these letters. She found it the most distasteful part of her ministry, pointing out people's problems that she was shown. Uh, send a message to this man, to this woman, okay? 
He receives a letter uh, from Ellen White about his improper conduct with women, which was causing a division in San Francisco. It was actually splitting the church. He, he actually took the attitude that, uh, you know, I can, you know, I'm not doing anything improper. I can, you know, walk with who I want to, want to walk with on the street. Um, he said it was nobody's business. He could walk the streets with whomever he pleased. It caused a dissension, and she wrote this letter to him, and it arrived. She wrote it uh, January 28th. Actually, that's when he received it. Uh, she had actually written it January 18, 10 days earlier. And he accepted, his, he accepted her rebuke, and it actually strengthened the believer's faith in Ellen White as a special messenger of God, receiving this counsel right when they knew that there was a problem. At least uh, some of the church was realizing there was a big issue. It was splitting the church. However, during these years, um, his repentance was not what it should have been, such that four years later, he's 49 years old, he loses his ministerial credentials. But interestingly enough, he continues freelance preaching. Um, there's another section in the book mentioned under J.H. Uh, Wagner's uh, story in Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, Adultery, and Divorce entitled A Public Evangelist, pages 166 to 181. They are written about M.E. Cornell. So you now know a, la a name to put on that story if, as you read it. Uh, he had a wife. Yes. He had a wife. Uh, I don't know all the story about that. There is something I read at one point that m may have indicated some, some uh, speaking of, of wives and spiritualism, that she had some affinity for actual spiritualism. But I found nothing more about it, so I didn't really put it in the outline to uh, document it in any, any way specifically. Um, but it's clear um, what she wrote. And I've given you some samples here um, of the letters. Uh, 1871, this actually is before the letter that he got in San Francisco notice. So these are not one-time letters, and they cover uh, quite a period of time. There are four letters that she, she wrote to him from 1871 to 1880, and I'm giving you a sample now from two of them. And here it's, he's called Brother R, but it's, it's Cornell. But Brother Cornell, I was shown that you are now that you now should be very circumspect in your deportment and in your words. You are watched by enemies. You have great weaknesses for a man who is as strong as you are to move the crowd. So he had a power as a speaker to move people. But he said, she said, you have a great weakness. Weaknesses, she puts it plural. As you are now separated from your wife, and she didn't say here uh, maritally or just in uh, work that he was doing, the story that I read one place was that when he would do evangelism and move on, he would leave his wife to follow up the interest. And so he was separated perhaps in that respect as well. I'm not clear here whether it's a marital separation or just the other one. As you are now separated from your wife, there will be suspicion and jealousy and falsehoods will be framed even if you give no occasion. But if you are not cautious, you will, you will bring a reproach upon the cause of God which could not soon be wiped away. You may feel, as I saw you have felt, had felt, that you, if you were not going to, to live with your wife, there's clear, it's marital separation, you wish to be free from her. You are restless, uneasy, and unsettled. Satan is tempting you to make a foolish man of yourself. Now is the time for you to show yourself a man, to exhibit the grace of God by your patience, your fortitude, and your courage. So we don't know all the details as to what caused the separation and the fact that they were not living and he wished to be free from her. 1876, this is the year he lost his credentials. God has erected the barriers of testimonies as a wall about you to guard you from falling under the specious wiles of the enemy. But you break down all these and press over everything to follow your inclination. Your sorrow for your sins is like that of those who anciently rent their garments to express their grief, but did not afflict their souls. You have not a correct sense of what sin is. 
the aggravating character of unchastity of thought and actions you have not sensed. Your mind is carnal, and that almost continually. If you really were thought, if you really were sorry for your sins, if you really had a true sense of your wrongs, you would exercise that repentance that needeth not to be repented of. I desire now to state facts. I have been shown that your life and your labors in the cause of God for some years have been a greater injury to the precious cause of present truth than a benefit. What a testimony. And it would make sense that that would be the year they would take away his credentials. But apparently he didn't lose total faith in God because he continued doing some freelance preaching. Uh, he still did not abandon his faith. And the story is that after separation from the ministry, Ellen White continued to write to him and his wife, which means apparently they got back together, concerned about their salvation. They lived in Maryland for some time in the 1880s, and they were actually visited by Ellen White during that period of time in the 1880s. So she did not give up on people. She actually, again, we would consider it a pastoral type of visit, a friendly visit, a, a fellow visit by a fellow Christian. 1886. September 6. He's 59 years old. This is 10 years later, right? And in this letter, actually to Butler regarding J.H. Wagner, she talks about J.H. Wagner's case was worse than Cornell's. And that Cornell's credentials were taken away from him, but he is a deeply repenting man, humbled in the dust. And that was something that she could not say at that point about Wagner in writing about this. So it seemed like there were these two men about the same time that God was having to deal with. Satan was using to make an impact on the, on the uh, cause of present truth in a negative way. Three years later, he's 62 years old, he moves back to Michigan. By the way, before we go on, I wanted to show you a picture of him in his early years. Can you see what he's doing? He's an evangelist, right? He's preaching about the prophecies. And there's the time chart right there beside him. Another, another chart rolled up, right? <laughs> On the table. So that's, that's him preaching. Power to move crowds. We're told, power to move crowds. But again, um, a man who had uh, fallen human nature like we all have and had a weakness that he was not totally submitted to the Spirit about uh, through these years and not humble and distrustful of his own weaknesses. He moves back to Michigan at age 62. The next year, age 63, he's reconciled to the church and he is given his credentials Again. Do they do that nowadays? If they lose the will they reinstate them? It depends, I think, on case by case basis as to what they what they sense. But again, they had the testimony of the messenger here that he was deeply repenting and humbled in the dust. And so they felt if a person is deeply repenting and humbled in the dust, that means they are distrustful of them themselves and they're they are depending on God. And so, you know, they they potentially, again, can be used by God. Uh, I don't have a clear reference to describe what he did the next three years, but he lived only three years longer, dying in, in November the 2nd of 1893 at the age of 66 from internal bleeding. Interestingly enough, in Corliss's description of him that we had, uh, had noted earlier, um, Corliss described him as the stormy petrel. <laughs> Speaking of a bird, right? Yes, and based on what Ellen White wrote there in 1886, she clearly said that. Mm -hmm. He was deeply repenting and humbled in the dust. So God was able to uh, restore him at that point um, to the work before he died. And this picture, I think, in Colleen's notebook is the same one as we have there. So she has a notebook on him as well. So again, what can we learn from this uh, maybe modern-day Peter <laughs> who um, had his own struggles? 
share what you've heard with passion. <laughs> um, don't wait next year to do what you can do this year. God wants to move and He wants to move now often, right? Um, let God use you in carrying the truth to new areas. But be cautious of your weaknesses. Because every one of us has a weakness that without depending upon God will ruin us for eternity. We have a human nature that is, is bent away from God. And so we need to learn that lesson. And again, I, I, as I said before, I say again, the stories of these men don't make me discredit them any more than the stories of David and Solomon and the other people in the Bible. Not that what they did was right or uh, did not have negative consequences. There's always negative consequences which are, are, are present for eternity. But God can redeem and God can forgive and He can restore um, if we will humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, which is what each of us need to learn to do as we live our lives.